We start today's show with a touch of class, gliding through the woods in Lexus's new hybrid engine sedan, the IS300H. The luxury car maker is hoping the new range will help it replicate success in North America across the pond. Lexus's Sandra Tibor says they have a development center near Brussels where various parts of cars are tuned to fit the needs and demands of customers in different countries. The front of the new bodywork is especially striking. The grille with large air inlets shows off the brand's new look. The car's just over four and a half meters long. Small wings on the door pillars and tail lamps are designed to make the IS more aerodynamic. With a turning circle of 11.2 meters, the car maneuvers well. Our test driver Matas Kurat is putting the IS through its paces. He's testing the F Sport model with a 2.5 liter four cylinder engine combined with an electric motor. Together, they produce 164 kilowatts. The car goes from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 8.3 seconds and has a top speed of 200. Also so richtig sport Mata says the IS isn't very sporty, even though there's a dial that switches the car to Sport S or Sport S Plus mode. He says that when he tries to take a corner with a bit more speed, the ESP kicks in. So either the ESP is too sensitive or the chassis isn't quite balanced. Mata says the ergonomics are good. All of the important things are well placed. He also says the buttons are more graceful than in other Toyota and Lexus models. The temperature control is particularly interesting. The joystick operator for the entertainment system takes some getting used to, but Mata says with practice it's not so bad. A real problem for him is the lack of storage space. The car starts without a key, and Matis had to put the key in the drinks holder because there's nowhere else at the front of the car to put it. But Matis says he does like the fabric used on the front and center columns and the ceiling. He says it creates a good impression. Mata says he really likes the digital console which shows information on this ring. It's controlled with a button on the steering wheel. Mata says it's just a gadget, but a fun one. So how does the IS measure up? With the entertaining and useful extras, it scores highly. The most important fact for any hybrid car is how much fuel it uses. For a sedan, the figures are good. The 300H weighs 1,700 kilos and uses just 4.7 liters of gas over 100 kilometers. As for CO2 emissions, the car produces 109 grams per kilometer. Matis gives his verdict on the IS. He says in terms of the design, he's totally satisfied. But when it comes down to how the car feels, he says even the F Sport model isn't quite sporty enough. Peugeot's RCZ is the French car maker's popular sport coupe. Six years ago at the International Motor Show in Frankfurt, the concept car wowed visitors with its extravagant design. Now, 50,000 units later, the sports car has had a facelift. At just under 4 meters 30 in length, the new version of the RCZ is around 10 centimeters longer than its most serious competitor, the Audi TT. The shape of the glass roof is a real eye-catcher.
But we want to get past the looks and see how the diesel model of the coupe really handles. Our test driver Sasha Knopp says he's using the 120 kilowatt version, one of three optional motors. But a lot of people are really looking forward to the new 260 horsepower motor, 191 kilowatts of power. It should really pack a punch, he says. The two liter diesel engine in our test car is no weakling. Its potential torque maxes out at 340 newton meters. And the car's other parameters are also nothing to sneeze at. The RCZ can hit 100 kilometers an hour in 8.7 seconds and has a top speed of 225 kilometers an hour. Peugeot says it burns 5.3 liters of fuel per 100 clicks on the road. The dash is well planned, with tachometer and speedometer given pride of place. It's a sports car after all. The steering wheel sits very well in the hand with a comfortable thumb rest, a nice detail. Our stick shift car has six gears. An automatic transmission can only be ordered for the smaller of the two gasoline driven motors. At need, the navigation system emerges from the dashboard into a position well in the driver's field of view. Another button deploys the spoiler and back. Sasha says the car is just 1.36 meters tall, but still offers plenty of headroom. The leather seats, unfortunately an extra, are a good investment. They feel luxurious and comfortable, with good lateral support. But Peugeot could have skipped the back seats, he says. Nobody would want to sit back there. The trunk has no hidden corners but it's far from spacious, and you have to heave things up pretty high to get them in. Total volume in the boot, 321 liters. Double that if you drop the rear seats. The RCZ isn't generous with space in either the back passenger seats or trunk, but it isn't supposed to be a station wagon, now is it? It looks great and drives well, but there are a few rough edges. The suspension is so stiff that bumps in the road are transferred straight to the driver and passengers. And the gears lie a little too far away from one another on the shifter. But handling is dynamic, and the car's low center of gravity and precise power steering get the job done. Sasha says the RCZ's 120 kilowatt diesel motor really steps up to the plate and that the turbocharger provides plenty of power to the axles. He thinks that the convertible version of the vehicle, which has a 260 horsepower, 191 kilowatt gasoline motor that Peugeot revealed as a concept car at the Geneva Motor Show earlier this year, actually makes it into production. It could be a really beautiful car. But this version is no slouch either, and it's significantly cheaper than the Audi TT competitor. In Germany, the RCZ can be had for under 30,000 euros. For Volkswagen, 2013 is the year of the electric car. Just in time for the International Motor Show in Frankfurt, VW is celebrating the world premiere of the E-Up. Its electric motor has 60 kilowatts of power, and like all electric cars, tremendous torque. With one fully charged battery, the E-Up can take you 160 kilometers. BMW is unveiling the third generation of the X5. The double headlights of this SUV now extend to the trademark BMW twin kidney grills. It also has a standard X-Drive all-wheel drive, and drivers will appreciate the new head-up display. The regular gas model has 330 kilowatts of power, the diesel has 190, while the M diesel has 280. This week we're taking a real classic city car out for a spin. For over 30 years, this peppy little Italian favorite has been a mainstay on the streets of Europe. The Fiat Panda is now in its third incarnation. 
Our car tester Stefan Hinson says it was easy to find his vehicle thanks to the navigation system. It's easy to remove it from the car, and then you can use it to find your way on foot, he says. Time to see how it does on the road. There's lots of glass in the little car and good visibility in all directions, a big plus in the city. Customers can choose between a diesel motor version, one that runs on natural gas, or one of two gasoline-driven models. We're testing the smaller but more powerful one, the 0.98V Twin Air. Thanks to a turbocharger, the two-cylinder motor ponies up 63 kilowatts of power, despite having less than a liter of displacement. That's not enough to turn the Panda into a sprinter, though. It takes the subcompact over 11 seconds to hit 100 kilometers an hour from a dead stop. But Fiat at least claims it's economical. The car maker says it burns just over four liters of fuel per hundred clicks on the highway. Stefan says that response is very sluggish when you step on the gas and that the 63 kilowatts of power don't really kick in until you hit around 2,000 RPMs. But driving like this, he says, will certainly affect the manufacturer's promised low fuel consumption claims. Uh, but let's be fair. After all, the Panda was never meant to compete on the racetrack. Its rounded corners and friendly exterior are meant to attract buyers who are looking for a more cuddly ride. No sharp edges here. The entire car is a study in curves. Even the geometric shapes in the grille, running lights and bumpers are organic. The first generation of Pandas won hearts as boxes on wheels. And the latest version is still very boxy, but every corner is rounded off. And with the Panda, design doesn't get in the way of functionality. The trunk has 225 cubic liters of space, and lowering the rear seats expands that to 870 liters. Stefan says that the Panda provides a very smooth ride once it gets rolling. Putting the car in city mode makes the steering wheel more responsive, he says. The Panda also has a stop-start system, and the gears shift very smoothly. Although there's plenty of plastic in the interior to cut costs, the Panda doesn't feel cheap. The dashboard elements fit the car's overall rounded personality. A bare-bones version of the Panda sells in Germany for less than 10,000 euros. To save space, all the seats have narrow backrests. A good idea, but a seating test shows that a taller than average driver makes for a very tight squeeze in back. There's enough headroom, but adults that have to sit in the rear probably won't enjoy it for long. In short, Says Stefan, the Fiat Panda drives well. It's agile and small enough that finding parking in the city shouldn't pose much of a problem. The perfect car for students or young people, he says, if it wasn't for that little question about fuel consumption. The old-timer Grand Prix brings tens of thousands of visitors to the Nürburgring circuit every year. The spectacle is also a chance for car owners to show off their prized possessions to the public, whether they're newer models or classic racing cars. The races themselves are almost an afterthought, but they're still full of excitement. Here, historic cars produced up to 1960 take to the track. On the famous Nordschleife, they show why motorsport fans from around the world were fascinated by them. In the pit lane, fans throng to their favorite car makers' tents. Many have brought their own automobiles, cars they use every day, that have racing in their genes. The thrill of competition is what their owners dream of.
Porsche is one of the brands taking part. This year, the company's got a special anniversary. The 911 is turning 50 years old. One of the world's most iconic cars is being celebrated with a huge beat of 911 owners. They're proud of one of Germany's great exports. This man says the 911's quality, style and technology set it apart. This owner says it's a car no one needs, but everyone wants. And this enthusiast says Porsche is a down-to-earth brand. He can drive his car anywhere because it's genuine and simple. The highlight for the 911 fans is a parade around the Nordschleife. These models show why the 911 is the standard other sports cars are measured against. It's suitable for both the racetrack and the open road. Rather than an eccentric toy for the rich and famous, it's a car that's passed the test of time. Back at the Porsche tent, the auto giants have some exhibits that deserve a spot in a museum. The 1984 Porsche Carrera was a masterpiece of aerodynamics. It had a CW value of just 0.27, meaning it had barely any drag. It still influences design today. And there's the 1987 Carrera Speedster. Only 2,103 were ever made. It's reminiscent of the Porsche 356 Speedster, bringing together the old and the new. Racing legend Derek Bell is joining in the celebrations. He won the Le Mans 24-hour race five times. Uh, well, the fascination is that the car is just is unique because it's been there for 50 years. No other manufacturer has managed to call a car a 911 or a, or a Jaguar 12 or whatever. It's a 911 and it's been there for 50 years and it yes, gets better every year. They improve it and they make it better and better and better and you can't beat that can you, you can't beat because the, the shape stays much roughly the same but the rest of the car just gets better even the interior is better the engine's better the suspension's better the aerodynamics and so therefore the car stays there and it's unique there's no other car in the world that's done that demand for classic and vintage cars is growing all the time that makes it more important than ever for car makers to maintain their history for Porsche owners, about 35,000 original parts are still available to make repairs on older models.